live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. There have been thousands upon thousands of practices in the over half-century-long history of the Miami Dolphins. Most practices are pretty uneventful, and just involve the players implementing the playbook and going up against each other. But every now and then, you get a practice that is absolutely bizarre, where nothing whatsoever makes any sense. Imagine signing a free agent, bringing him to Miami, having him take the physical, then having him practice, then cutting him before practice ends because as it turns out, he failed the physical, and then sending him back to his home city all in the span of about 12 hours. It's absolutely bonkers. I'm not even sure how something like that happens in the first place. However, as crazy and as ridiculous as this entire situation sounds, that's exactly what happened to the Miami Dolphins in 1984. When they signed running back Ricky Young, the first and only practice with the running back, considering the circumstances, might be the weirdest practice in the history of the franchise. And this is the story behind that crazy and somewhat surreal moment. Before I talk about the actual signing of Ricky Young and the practice at hand, we need some context to understand just who Young is, and why the Dolphins were looking at signing him in the first place. Our story begins nearly a decade before 1975, when the San Diego Chargers drafted Jackson State running back Ricky Young in the seventh round of the NFL Draft. Young played three seasons in San Diego, and was quite an effective back, especially in 1976, when he had over 1,200 yards from scrimmage. He was a dual threat. That season, only four backs in the league had at least 800 yards rushing and 400 yards receiving. That list consisted of Lionel Mitchell, Chuck Foreman, Otis Armstrong, and none other than Ricky Young. However, his time in San Diego would be short-lived, as in 1978, he was traded to the Minnesota Vikings in exchange for right guard Ed White. This was the true definition of a win-win trade. The Chargers got a guard who started 117 games for the team and played in San Diego until 1985, and made it to the Pro Bowl in 1979 and the Vikings got an incredibly productive player who was one of the top threats in the league during the end of the 1970s. In his first season with the Vikings, Young led the league with 88 receptions. Young became the second player in franchise history to lead the Vikings in this category, alongside Chuck Foreman in 1975. But perhaps most impressively, his 88 receptions marked the second highest total in NFL history in a single season. The only player in the NFL with more receptions was Johnny Morris, who had 93 during the 1964 season with the Chicago Bears. Young had another great year with the Vikings in 1979, when he had over 1,200 yards from scrimmage, recording 708 rushing yards and 519 receiving yards. Only two players in the NFL had 700 rushing yards and 500 receiving yards that season, Joe Washington and, of course, Ricky Young. However, the Vikings started phasing him out of the offense after the 1982 NFL Draft, when they chose running back Darren Nelson. I made a video on that, so if you want to learn more about that bizarre draft pick, then click the card in the upper right corner. By the time his career in Minnesota ended after the 1983 season, he had 3,999 yards from scrimmage with the team, just one shy of that coveted 4,000-yard mark. He was one of the best dual threats in the game, and scored his fair share of go-ahead and game-winning fourth quarter touchdowns. It was quite the career. But in his eyes, he wasn't done yet. Even though he was on the wrong side of 30, he had more to give to the game and more to offer to the sport. And midway through the season, it looked like he was going to get another shot. From the cold north of Minnesota, we head down to Miami, the city where the heat is on all night on the beach till the break of dawn. In 1984, the Miami Dolphins entered the season as one of the favorites to win it all, and rightfully so. They were 12-4 in 1983, winners of the AFC East. They had one of the greatest coaches of all time in Don Shula, a guy who really, if ever, had a bad year. They had Dan Marino, who despite being a rookie in 1983 and only starting nine games, made it to the Pro Bowl, went 7-2 as a starter, and finished the season with a pass rating of 96 which was the third highest in the NFL, and the highest in the entire AFC. Expectations were high for this team, especially if Marino could build off of a strong rookie season and pick up right where he left off. I think it's safe to say that the first game of the season put the rest of the league on notice. Miami opened their season on the road at RFK Stadium against Washington, the team that beat them at Super Bowl 17, the two-time defending champions of the NFC, and a team that had won 25 of their last 28 regular season games, dating all the way back to the end of the 1981 season. That's a winning percentage of over 89% over a stretch lasting more than two seasons. And yet, Miami destroyed them. Miami won the game 35-17 and led it 35-10 entering the fourth quarter. Many people point to this game as the best of Dan Marino's entire career. And it's not hard to see why, as he went 21-28 for with 311 yards passing, 5 touchdowns, no interceptions, no sacks, and a pass rating of 150.4. If Miami could stay healthy, they were going to be a force to be reckoned with. As you can probably expect, 
We threw through a wrench in that plan. The good news was that the Dolphins won the game convincingly, defeating the New England Patriots 28-7 to start the season off with a 2-0 record. The bad news was that Andre Franklin, their starting fullback who made the Pro Bowl in 1982 when the Dolphins last appeared in the Super Bowl, got badly injured, to the point where he would never play in the NFL again. The knee injury was that severe. And Franklin was an important part of that team. During that Week 2 game, all the other runners combined for just 48 yards on 23 carries, for an average of just over 2 yards. The Dolphins needed to find someone in free agency that could fill the void, and they knew just where to look. They looked to a guy who played in San Diego. They looked to a guy who had over 1,000 yards from scrimmage in his second season, had over 1,000 yards from scrimmage in 1979, and was just recently cut. That's right. They were looking at signing none other than Chuck Muncie. The original plan for Shula and company was to sign Muncie, who was still a very talented back. Muncie was a three-time Pro Bowler who led the league in rushing touchdowns in 1981. He was a big part in the success of the San Diego Chargers offensively during the early 1980s, when they found themselves as regular AFC contenders who would more often than not find themselves in the AFC Championship. He had over 9,000 yards from scrimmage in his career, and was a former first-round pick, which I talked about in a previous video of mine if you want to check that out by clicking the card in the upper right corner. The Dolphins were going to sign Muncie, he was going to replace Andre Franklin, and that was going to be the end of it. Except that didn't happen. Muncie failed the drug test, supposedly because there was marijuana in his system, and Commissioner Pete Rozelle banned Muncie from playing in the league ever again until he successfully got treated for drugs. Keep in mind that he wasn't just banned for marijuana, as that was the straw that seemingly broke the camel's back. Muncie was notorious for alcohol and cocaine problems, and some reports even indicate that the drug test he failed in Miami wasn't because of marijuana in his urine, but rather was because of cocaine. With that, the Dolphins had to go to Plan B, and that plan was Ricky Young. Sure, Young's numbers had gone down in recent years, and sure, the main reason Young was cut was because according to Viking spokesperson Merrill Swanson, he lost his speed over the years, and sure, he was not what he used to be in his prime during the latter portion of the 1970s. But this seemed like it could work out. Remember, the Dolphins just needed anybody at this point. They were desperate to fill the void left behind by Andre Franklin's terrible injury. So they signed Young. On September 14, 1984, Young landed in Miami at 1.30 a.m., super late in the night, and was ready to get going. Little did he know that about 12 hours later, he would be back in the air. What followed on September 14th has to be one of the strangest practices, if not the strangest practice in the history of the Dolphins. Young took a physical at the team facility at 6 a.m., working on no sleep whatsoever. Remember, he landed in Miami only four hours before this, and then had to go to wherever he was staying, and then had to leave that place to get to the facility. If Young got even two hours of sleep that night, all things considered, I would be impressed. However, he took the physical and then practiced with the team at 10 a.m. Everything was going smoothly. If you're practicing with the team, it probably means you passed the physical, right? It would be incredibly silly to have someone practice without passing a physical, just because of the liability that this would pose. But as you probably guessed, that's exactly what happened. Turns out, Young failed the physical. Only his practice was drawing to a close did Shula even find out about the results. And as practice ended, Shula pulled Young aside and probably said something along the lines of, yeah, thanks for coming, but this isn't going to work out. The results came as a complete surprise to everyone. Young said he passed a similar test in Minnesota. Team spokesperson Dan Edwards had no idea what the reason was for the failed test, and one Viking spokesperson said that he had no knowledge of any drug history involving Young in his six years with the team. Understandably, Young was upset and frustrated. This was one of his last opportunities to play in the league, and just like that, it was over. As Young said, I'm very disappointed. I would have liked to have played here, but I guess it just won't be. I don't know what showed up. All I know is that they told me I didn't pass. And with that, Young flew out that day at 2.45, going back to Minnesota. That has to be some of the craziest 12 hours ever. Later reports confirmed that Young had heavy traces of cocaine in his system, so it seemed like there was an unfortunate theme going on here. As for how the story played out for both sides, let's just say it worked out much better for the team than the player in question. Starting with Ricky Young, that was it. He never played another regular season game in the NFL again although he would wind up on Minnesota's preseason roster the following year in 1985. It was just about the most anticlimactic end to what was a pretty solid career, all things considered. He thought he was going to play for Miami and be their starting fullback, filling in out of necessity. And it didn't work out that way at all, with the end result being about one of the most awkward things possible. As for the Dolphins, they eventually filled the void with Pete Johnson. I talked about the signing of Johnson and how he scored a touchdown literally the day he arrived with the team, not knowing anything about the playbook, so if you want to learn more about that, then click the card in the upper right corner. Johnson scored 9 touchdowns in 13 games for the Dolphins that season, 
And though he would never play in the NFL again after that 1984 season, he did play a big part in helping Miami make it to Super Bowl 19, where they would lose to the San Francisco 49ers. So I guess even if it took about the strangest route possible to get there, it worked out for Miami in the end. But like I said, how we got to that point was extremely bizarre, and it'd be tough to have a practice weirder than this one. To sign a player, bring him out on an overnight flight, then bring him to the team facility early in the morning to take a physical, then have him practice with the team, then find out in the middle of practice that he didn't pass the physical, then to not remove him from practice even though he failed the physical, and then to inform him afterwards that he failed, only to send him back home on a flight roughly two hours later? Good luck topping that bizarre saga. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JRGator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See so how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.